Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ashok, and I'm talking about Drupal backend performance and scalability. Unfortunately, my uh, co presenter, Cristofano, was double booked with another session, so he won't be able to make it. But uh, hopefully, I can do him justice. And uh, just about a little bit about me. I am a systems programmer who works at the California Institute of the Arts. I've been working on Drupal since uh, 2006. I help with patches and upgrades for contributed modules, and I have a very strong interest in server optimization. And uh, about my co-presenter that's not here, his name's Cristofano, and he's the LA Drupal, uh, he's one of the LA Drupal managers and uh, a camp organizer. And he's also on the Drupal.org and GDO webmaster teams. And some of the resources uh, that I'm going to be using for this presentation and that I've used personally on my own set of websites are from uh, Khaled Bahe Yeldon, who, uh, who runs tubus.com, and he has lots and lots of useful information about uh, optimizing Drupal in the back end. You can also look at Drupal.org Infrastructure Group for ideas that you could use on your own sites. And Peter Zaitsev, who writes, MySQL per, who writes on mysqlperformanceblog.com and is one of the core contributors to the MySQL project as well. So he has very useful information about MySQL itself. So what are our goals in this? Um, if anyone had come to my front-end presentation, they'll recognize the screen. And um, what are your, it's basically about what your objectives are from the site or whatever you're trying to do. Do you want a faster response to the end user on each page? Do you want to be able to handle more page views? Do you want to minimize the downtime? I.e., do you want your server to not crash? Um, each is different, though in a lot of ways they're also related. And in some cases there are low-hanging fruit that are really easy to see and that provide a noticeable improvement with very little effort. And a lot of this can be seen from the front end performance, but there are cases also in back end performance. And in some cases, it gets really hard to achieve more performance. And you see more of this in the back end section. So it can involve adding more infrastructure. So you may need to split up your servers, have multiple web and database servers. You may need to start patching Drupal or you may need to do significant revisions to your architecture and really rethink what you have running in the first place. And to do all this, you need to be able to diagnose what sort of problems you actually have. Because you don't suddenly want to start running around changing things without really understanding the problem. So if you're starting to optimize Apache when your real problem is with the database server, no matter how much optimizations you do to that Apache server, nothing's going to change. And it may just keep crashing over and over until you realize, oh, it is the database server that I should have been working with. And you want to try and base this on proper data because once you have that kind of data, you can analyze it and you can really narrow down um, the scope of what you're trying to optimize. So you do end up ruling out something like optimizing your Apache server. So we'll be looking at some tools to measure and diagnose these issues and some of the speed optimizations that you can provide to all of this. So let's, so we're going to be discussing the server. Unlike anyone who may have seen the front end performance, this is a much more complex problem and many of you might agree with that. There are many measurement and monitoring tools. There is hardware that you have to think about. You have to consider what's on your LAMP stack or, you know, LNMP stack, stack if you're using Nginx or whatever it might be. And you have to uh, take a serious look at Drupal as well, uh, such as database queries, the modules you're using, what's being cached, and where it's being cached. And like I mentioned in the, valid, in the diagnosis por portion, you really need to, in order to avoid a wild goose chase, you should try and validate all of these results on a test server. So if you're noticing problems on your main server and you have an inkling of where the problem might be, having a test server that has 
the same configurations and maybe the same set of issues would be the best place to start. So then you can try and replicate all of these issues and see what's happening. And the backup and migrate module might help with actually migrating and having a server with similar content. And then just having some sort of ghosting tool to replicate the actual server. So you want to recreate the site. Uh, if you're running it on a slower server, you want to gather a time difference ratio between the test and production server. And in most cases, the production server is going to be faster. But, so this way, you get a rough idea of any improvements you're making. So if you're seeing twice of an improvement with some change you made on your test server, you should be able to see something similar on your production server as well. And you want to measure and again to see if the relative timings are remaining the same. So, most commonly people use a LAMP stack which consists of Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Apache is changing more and more and MySQL is being replaced by other things, but these are the most common things. And most of this presentation applies to people that use FreeBSD or some other variant of it as well. So when you're looking at hardware, the actual server does matter. So dedicated, it, uh, if you have a dedicated server or a VPS server, that can make a difference. If something's in the cloud, that makes a difference too. And I think the cloud does work. Um, having multiple cores is becoming more and more normal. So you know, it's more and more common to see eight cores or 16 cores or more on servers now. Having lots of RAM is very useful and having multiple disks is useful as well. And I believe Christoph Weber is talking about flash storage tomorrow and I think that might be, and he's in the audience right now, and I think his might be a useful presentation about hardware optimizations as well. Um, a chunk of this presentation is not really applicable to shared hosting, primarily because you don't have access to this kind of information on it. And if you're on shared hosting, I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the first thing sometimes people try when they have, you know, slowdown in their backend is add multiple servers. So you could have, and the most common configuration is to have one database server and multiple web servers. So you could use a DNS round robin for load balancing. So you just have something randomly generating a request to one of those web servers. Or you could use a reverse proxy like Varnish, which is used on Drupal.org. You really want to use it only if you have the budget, though, because uh, as you start adding more and more servers to your to your infrastructure. Um, it's going to start getting more and more expensive, not just on the actual cost of hardware, but on the cost of maintaining it and on in terms of whatever you're writing to make any changes. As an example, uh, in Drupal 5, or sorry, in the stock version of Drupal 6, you can't really do um, master-slave configurations for database servers unless you, well, you patch or hack Drupal. And when you do that, you might even then you might still see uh, strange issues occurring between replication of your master and slave servers and it could lead to your site just crashing out of the blue. So, and some of this can be avoided by simply tuning a system. Um, it can avoid or delay having that split hardware. So, what are testing tools that you can use? Well, if you want to test it in terms of your load times or how much load can your server handle, you could use AB or AB2, and this is a standard tool supplied by Apache, and it stands for Apache Benchmark. And with that, the first command I have, AB-C50-N10,000, is basically saying do 50 concurrent requests for up to 10,000 requests. And this tests the average response time per second and how many requests can be, i.e. how many requests can be handled per second. And you can also test it with authenticated sessions. However, with all of these kind of tools, when you're basically hammering a server, I very strongly recommend not doing it on your production server because you could bring it down. And especially if you're testing HTTPS, which takes more of a server load, you're going to definitely see your site completely get hammered and wiped out. 
I did it on a server by mistake once, and um, my boss wasn't happy. <laughs> um, there are other similar tools, Siege, which uh, also can test uh, post functionality, but you can't use it natively on Windows. There's JMeter, which is a desktop application written in, written in Java. So you can use it on, technically you could use it on any machine, except for maybe FreeBSD, which has some weird <coughs> Java licensing issues. Um, for other tools that you can use, uh, you can use Top, which is which is a really useful program. Uh, it's, it's part of most Linux installations. It gives a real-time monitoring of what your system is doing. Uh, it can give you the load average, the CPU utilization, how much memory you're using. It gives you the list of all the processes. You can sort it in many different ways. And um, another tool is HTOP, which is very similar to TOP, but it's for multiple cores. So it can feel a little faster, and there are colors and styles to make it more readable as well. And uh, just to give an idea of what top looks like. So this is what a top screw, when you type in top, this is what it might look like. So you can see how many processes are running, um, what are of, of the ones that are running, how many are sleeping, what the load average is on the server at that time, how much memory is being used, all that jazz. Um, so it's very useful for figuring out what's happening on your server right at that moment. Oh, oops. Let's close it. Other tools that you could use. Um, ATOP which uh, shows network statistics and it can run a daemon in the background as well. I believe you can download this one. Um, other ones that I've used are mainly used are VMstat and NetStat. And VMstat reports statistics on the memory that you have. And this can also be displayed in increments, so uh, it'll keep showing, uh, it'll give you snapshots every five seconds or 10 seconds or every second, however you want it for what's happening with your RAM on your server. And NetStat shows whatever kind of uh, network connections are there. For graphical monitoring tools, which might be much easier for people to read, there's Cacti, Munin, and Nagios. Cacti and Munin are some of the more standard ones that I've seen people use. Uh, they're both available as packages on Ubuntu and Debian. And I'm not sure if they're available on any other Linux and FreeBSD flavors. Um, the graphs are really easy to understand. They, you can have a history over week, month, year. It has many different configurations as well. So you can see it for CPU, Apache, MySQL. Uh, there are many others that have been written by other people as well. So if you're using something like Memcached, there is a, there is a, uh, there's a graph tool set that someone else has written that you could use on your own server. Um, as I mentioned, Munin is very similar, and it also lets you create your own monitoring scripts. Uh, I haven't used Nagios yet, but from everything I've heard, it is supposed to be very powerful. Uh, it gives alerts by email, SMS, all that kind of stuff. And there's also a Drupal module with, that integrates with the tool. And if one of you has used Nagios, I'd be really happy to hear more about it. It's really good. It requires a lot of time to set up and administer. Mm -hmm. But um, perhaps the best feature about that thing is that you can send SMMT traps when alerts happen to your other monitoring tools. Oh, and really? The operators actually are looking at so that you don't have to have them all in Nagios, which is a behemoth ominous system that your general purpose operator is just going to get really wide eyed, deer in the headlights look on his face with. So you can try and scale that down into something that's a little more simple. Mm -hmm. What we're doing at the university right now is using Big Brother. That's what they look at. But we've got other tools like OEM, things like Nagio, Savix. They're actually watching and charting the system so that when the application or a database administrator needs to look and see why did a particular thing happen, not that it did, but why, mm -hmm. um, we can go to the other tools that are a little bit more verbose and you know, have that data. Interesting. Very good. It takes a lot of time to set up. Interesting. I'd, I'd love to talk with you after the presentation on that. So, and I think someone else had their hand up as well. You mentioned Zavix. I was going to, um, I, would, I would definitely recommend Zavix. You can anything else. 
Okay. Which one? Maverick's ethics. Z-A-V-I-X. Yeah. 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 I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, is it even an R&D tool on the back end? So, I mean, they've got charts and, and uh, the module creation is very easy. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I think that they pulled out of Maverick that I really like in Angios is the VRML render. You can get like a VRML snapshot of your data center that you have configured in Angios. You used to be able to do this in Zavik, but they pulled it out. Yeah, um, yeah, that, and that's like my dream for having like newcomers into our organization. I'm gonna say, here, here's identity, here's a picture. Go and check it out. You can see what everything's talking about, everything else. I'm out. I'm going with it. Interesting. I'll be, I'll update the, uh, the presentation page as well to be able to add Zapix on there so some people will have more ideas on what they could use on their thing. So thank you very much on that. Um, most people typically use some variant of Linux or BSD. You want to try and use a proven stable distribution for your, for your server. So Debian stable, uh, an LTS version of Ubuntu, or Red Hat Linux, or CentOS, not, not something else necessarily. You want to try and use a recent version of those, uh, of those operating systems. But most importantly, you want to use whatever, your, whatever distribution your staff has the most expertise with. So if you're working in an IT department and you're good with Debian, but the rest of them are good with FreeBSD, and they're the ones actually managing that server, then you'll just have to get used to FreeBSD because that's, that's what they have to actually maintain. And you should try to avoid bloat. So don't start installing PostgreSQL if you're only using MySQL, or don't install Nginx if you're going to be using Apache, or you know don't install Java if you're not having Solar on there. You want to try and balance compiling your own programs versus using packages from the distribution. And the reason I mention compiling your own programs is sometimes the packages that come from the distribution might be severely outdated. As an example, Ubuntu, or not Ubuntu, sorry, Debian uh, comes with Varnish 1. And if you try to use that with a Drupal installation, it is quite broken. And for a while, I was trying to figure out why it's broken, and I and Cristofano, and then we talked with Josh Koenig of Chapter 3 about this issue because he uses uh, Varnish with Mercury, with Project Mercury. And he mentioned, yeah, don't use Varnish 1. It's, it's broken. Use Varnish 2. And in that kind of scenario, either you can look at the uh, unstable packages that are available in Debian, which comes in Varnish 2, or just compile your own version. And that might be the way to go. At the same time, if you need to upgrade any particular packages in the future, if you've compiled your own version, you'll have to go through that process again. So it's uh, just keep that in mind for your own sanity. And um, so now let's get to Apache. I think, I'm not sure how many people use that. I use it, so that's why I'll be talking about it. It's, I think it's safe to say it is one of the more popular uh, installations that people use. It's fairly well supported. It's feature rich. It's fairly stable. Um, it can also be enabled with too many unnecessary modules. So a lot of sites that I've seen just have the CGI module enabled. You don't need it. It's, it's not good anyways. So just disable whatever cruft you don't need, and it'll result in a smaller process so more users can access the site. And the command you can use is Apache CTL, or Apache Control dash M, which displays all the modules that are currently enabled on your Apache server. And then you can try and get rid of some of this stuff. Another one monitoring tool that you could use with this is Apache Top. And it's available at the web address that I've provided here. And it reads and analyzes the Apache access logs. It can show all or recent hits. It's good to detect crawlers with it, basically. Um, so, what are some optimizations that you can have with Apache? Well, you can change the maximum number of clients that can come onto your site. So, if your number is too high, you could run out of memory and you could start swapping. So basically your server dies and it can't serve any more clients. 
and if it's too low you can't really serve enough clients so you know if you ha if you have it set up for 50 users and 51 come to your site that 51st user is just going to see too many connections or some weird looking thing yes are you using um, are you using for worker um i don't remember my PSP, I believe, prefers pre-fork. Might be pre-fork that I'm using that. You are using, you are using my PSP then? Yes. Or that's what I'm going to be talking about, though there are other ways to do it. Um, you can change the maximum number of requests per child, so you can tune it to terminate the process faster and free up memory, so as soon as it's used up, just kill it and serve the next process. You can use keep alive, so you can keep a connection on with a particular user. So then that way, uh, let's say there are 30 different uh, assets on your site, and that can include HTML, CSS, JavaScript, all of that stuff. By having keep alive on, the, the connection is only made once to the server, and then it continues with it to try and download any new assets, whereas if you had it off, it would need to reestablish the connection again and again with your server. And Keep Alive is an easy way to uh, make things faster. Mod GZIP and Deflate are, um, are pretty standard things. They're very useful. It'll GZIP whatever content is there and then serve that to the user so then it gets unzipped on their end. So it is slightly more processor intensive just for gzipping the content on your side, but the bandwidth savings can be huge. So it's definitely recommended. And especially if you have something like uh, Apache caching enabled, then you know it does it once and it's gonna remain like that for a while. <coughs> so what are alternative servers you could use? Um, there's LightTPD, which is or used to be popular with Ruby on Rails. It is much lighter than Apache. Uh, you can, I've seen processes as low as one megabyte but it's known to have leaks. Um, the alternative, and probably a very strong alternative, would be using Nginx, which is much more stable than Lighty. It's, it's easier to set up. And, well, I have this for last year where Drupal Camp LA was running it. Now it's on Apache. But I've seen many servers running Nginx without any issues whatsoever. In both of these cases, PHP is run only as fast CGI and it splits up as separate processes in that scenario. Other alternatives you can have, and these are not really alternatives, but additions that you might have on your server. Uh, it might be, you might want to strongly consider using a uh, reverse proxy on your, on your machine. So Varnish is an HTTP accelerator, and you can set it up as a reverse proxy to send the call to Apache if it cannot or should not serve something itself. So you could serve anonymous page requests, static files, all through Varnish without it even hitting Apache. So it, it can really save on the resources used on your machine in terms of CPU time. Uh, Varnish is not, is not particularly difficult to set up, but it does require some level of tuning. And by that I mean if you just run Varnish by itself. You'll see your site loading up really quickly initially, but over time you might see it start to become really slow. And it might be a bit confusing on why that might be happening. But there's just, I think the way items get hashed in the back end and when it's trying to call them back again, just becomes overly complex and that becomes, that's the part that becomes time consuming. So I strongly recommend looking at the Varnish performance settings that are on varnishcache.org for this part. Uh, those were really useful. Yes? When it comes to setting up a Varnish server, what kind, of, um, what kind of memory parameters do you recommend using? Depends on how big your site is, but you know, it could be, I would recommend anywhere from 256 megs and up, if possible. Like that's ample how amount of... How more virtual memory? How much virtual memory Um, I do give it more swap space. I usually do at least one and a half times. Okay. Yeah. You could do more. Um, 
Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, it is used on Drupal.org. It will be used on ledrupal.org as well as uh, DrupalCampLA.com. And another option you could use, or might want to use, is Squid. Though I don't really recommend it now, since it is quite outdated at this point. And Varnish is probably the better way to go at this point. So now we end up at the database layer. And I'll be talking mainly about MySQL. I haven't worked with SQL Server or Postgres, so I can't really answer on those parts. And by all counts, it is the most popular database for Drupal. It's not necessarily the best database, but it does a good enough job. It's, it's usually pretty easy to set up, and there are many different pluggable engines for it. And some of the tools that you can use for it, and some of these tools are um, MyTop or MTOP, which is very similar to Top for seeing your CPU resources, but this is for MySQL. And it can show you real-time monitoring, and it can show you slow queries and locks as they might be occurring on the server. But if you have neither one installed, you can simply just go into uh, MySQL and type in show full process list. So it'll show you all the queries that are occurring on your server at that time. Or you can type MySQL admin process list. The, those are great, but the two tools I really strongly recommend using are MySQL report which gives reports of the server. And it doesn't exactly give you recommendations, but it shows how your server is performing. And based off that, you can then fine tune your uh, MySQL config file. And this is used by Drupal.org. And even though it requires some level of understanding what the, uh, what, what the report is giving you, it is, it is highly, highly recommended. The second one is uh, MySQL DB Tuner, which is at MySQL Tuner slash MySQL Tuner. It, uh, you basically run it on your server, and it provides some decent recommendations. So typically, I use a combination of MySQL Report and MySQL DB Tuner to, uh, to A, get some recommendations from it, and MySQL Report to get some more detailed recommendations after that point. You can also use the slow query log, which you can enable from your uh, MySQL config file. And you just tell it to list queries that are longer than n seconds. You can also ask it to list queries which don't have any indexes. And it's very useful to identify any potential bottlenecks. And just as an example, it helped me identify that account query that I had in that I was trying through the search module was uh, causing the site to really slow down. I removed the count with a base query, which cut the search query and rendered to less than half the time. Like, it, it was a significant difference. And the best way to interpret all of this is the, using the MySQL slow log parser script. And you can find this utility at mysqlperformanceblog.com. Uh, again, very highly recommended. So. Now we go into the different engines that are there. So the typical engine that you know people will install with if they're just creating their fresh new Drupal site is MyISM. That's that's what MySQL supports. It's or that's what they comes with the stock version, and that's what it creates the tables in. It has fast reads, it doesn't have a lot of overhead, but it has very poor concurrency, so you can get table level locking. So if you have a lot of users that are coming to your site and then trying to write to the cache on the same ID, you're going to see some, some interesting errors. Um, after that, when that fails, it's probably best to use in a DB. And in fact, it's probably recommended to use in a DB in any case. It is transactional. In some cases, it is slower. And there are lots of settings to analyze and change. But there is much better concurrency. And you can get just as, if not better, performance than my ISOM. And now there are other new engines in development, such as Falcon and Solid DB. And MySQL itself is going in many different directions at this time. So there is a version called MariaDB. There's one uh, from Percona, which, is, which serves a forked version of the InnaDB engine. 
there are Google patch sets, and in the future there's going to be MySQL 5.5. 5. Um, there's just a whole lot of different work going on in many different directions. And to get more information about it, I recommend looking at the session by Narayan Newton from DrupalCon San Francisco, where he talked just about the future of MySQL. It, it's eye-opening, and it can be a concern or a good thing, depending on how you look at it. Is Oracle doing a lot with that? It wasn't for a while. <laughs> yeah, pretty well. That's that's been part of the reason why there have been a number of forks. Like, the something weird was just happening in the community, and a lot of the patches that were being, uh, you know, supplied by Percona weren't being added into MySQL, and they just gave up and forked off on their own version at that point. And, if, and the version that the creator of MySQL made is MariaDB, and I believe that's the, that's the engine that is being used on Drupal.org right now. Okay. Yes. Narayan Newton is one of them. Yeah, I mean, Narayan is the biggest proponent of it. Yes. So most of the OSL guys uh, right. are big on MariaDB. Um, and it's, it's relatively stable. It's a drop in replacement. Right. SQL. So they keep up to date with all the latest MySQL releases. Mm -hmm. And then they do patch sets off of that. Um, and they'll kick out, they have a, a testing base that they run on their stuff. Um, and they kick out anything that doesn't uh, match regression. Cool. And the, the Drupal 7 documentation has been updated recently and we could have a DB so we can talk a little bit oh, okay. from that perspective. Huh. I, I'd love to see some of the links so then I can post them back here as well so for more information. Um, so then if we're going to be doing some sort of database tuning without changing you know, database structures, or even if we change them, some of the things that we can change include the query cache or the key buffer. Those are especially important if you're using MyISM. Other important ones include the table cache, the sort buffer size, read buffer size, and the temp table size. And just keep in mind that the temp table size should be same or greater than the query cache uh, size that you have. So if your temp table size is 16 megs and your query cache size is 32 megs, everything is basically, those portions are going to only be cached to 16 megs. Um, if you're using in a DB, the buffer pool size is probably the most important parameter you can change. And you really want to set this value to 50 to 80% of the total memory you want to allocate towards MySQL. It makes a huge difference. And there are more, lots and lots of settings that you could go into this. Uh, it's a ton of detail. And I strongly recommend looking at my SQL performance blog and some of the presentations that are up there for all of the settings that you can change. And just go with that. It, you'll see big differences on your site if you're using InnoDB. You could, other things you can do include setting up a uh, master slave structure. It is used on Drupal.org and, you know, the insert, delete, update queries go to the master, select qu queries go to the slave. Um, it provides a noticeable in improvement. When I had done it on, this was with stock Drupal, with the patch that was there for six, uh, for Drupal 6, uh, when I used it, we did see noticeable improvements, but we also found some issues where when the connection between the master and slave went kind of uh, screwy, the, uh, the slave didn't replicate properly and it kind of crashed and then it crashed our site. But what I found from that is I reevaluated the servers that we did have. I did extensive tuning of the master server and I found huge improvements despite the lack of querying the slave server and we got rid of it altogether at that point and the site seemed to perform better than before. It didn't seem to. It did. Now we can move on to uh, PHP. So you want to use a recent and stable release. 
Uh, Drupal 7 will require 5.2 and above, and so do a few uh, contributed modules. However, certain contributed modules don't work with Drupal 5.3. I ah, PHP 5.3. What am I saying? So just keep. And some of those modules are like the date and calendar. They do have some issues with it. So keep that in mind. You want to stick with the 5.2 line for now, unless you're using Drupal 7, in which case you can move to 5.3. And you want to use an opcode cacher or uh, accelerator. So you can use eAccelerator, APC, Xcache, or the Zend Optimizer. Those are the most common ones. And it's very useful in bringing down memory usage for a site. So as an example, a site that might take up 20 to 25 megs of memory without an opcode cacher, you might see an improvement where the memory usage goes down to 5 to 10 megs, if that. Uh, maybe less than that. It, it's extremely useful. It, it can significantly, significantly speed up your site. Yes. What does it take to install something like APC? Is it you have to hook it into Drupal in particular ways? I mean, is there an APC module, or is it just something you install on the server side? It's on the server side. And uh, in the case, pardon? I'm saying I can install APC. Right. So, uh, you know, if you're using something like Debian or whatever, sometimes they'll have a package called PHP-APC. Or if you install the Peckle libraries for PHP, then you can do Peckle install APC. And you just have to enable it on your site. That's all it takes. That's, that's the first step, yeah. And that itself can yield some pretty good improvements on the site. Now, uh, when you install it, there are settings that you can tune for it, particularly for APC. That's usually that's one of the more common ones that I've seen used. Between the four, between I've used eAccelerator and I've used APC, and in the past I found that while eAccelerator is faster and uses less memory, it's not as stable. So I found APC just seems to work better in that case, but I may be wrong. Yes? Yeah, uh, in our use as well, we found, like, we ran, we run three of them. We run XCAD, uh, eAccelerator, and APC. Mm -hmm. um, we found similar results. XCAD was slower for us mm -hmm. in most of our production work. Um, APC was far away the most stable, though. It's yes. That's main aim. Yes. It's maintained by the creator of PHP. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So like APC for us is worked really well. We got a lot of segmentation faults with the accelerator, mm -hmm. which results in a lot of white screens. Yes. And you heard, so you have to write your own uh, you know, polling scripts to check and see if anything goes down. And right. Uh, Apache and other things to fix itself. So it's kind of thing. So my recommendation is it. Yeah. Content. Very strongly. Um, this is where I mentioned, like I'd mentioned for our site, um, we ha on the Zimmer Twin site, um, when we used APC, our memory usage per process went down from 20 megs to 4. So, you know, we're serving five times as many users, basically, right from that. Uh, usage on calars.edu went from 35 megs to 7. I mean, again, huge. And if you're serving cache pages, it's even lower than that. So, you know, your the number of people you can serve pages to just increases. You can see an uh, a comparison article between Xcache, APC, and eAccelerator by uh, call it from two bits at the URL I provided here. And this uh, presentation will be online as well, so that you can access the links and uh, and read it in more detail later on. Some of the drawbacks. Um, the person in the back mentioned it. I, I don't know your name, but sorry. Um, the opcode caching may crash, and it may show the person the white screen of death. Uh, so it may, your server may require a restart, or it may be as simple as clearing the cache that's there in APC or whatever it might be, and that might resolve your issue. You can, if you're using Xcache, which is what the, for, the people at this by them use, they actually have a Capistrano script, which will clear it out, and I've, it, it might be useful for you. And so opcode caching won't work in all circumstances, such as database queries. That's on the database. Uh, sorting arrays, network connections. And there are some 
corporate modules such as Tagadelic and Tracker. And I would have talked about Hip Hop PHP, but I don't think that really works with Drupal quite yet. Or I'm not quite certain. Yes? So actually, um, Killian's actually got excited one day and wrote uh, Drupal.org uses. Uh huh. So, like, uh, so they, they have done test cases running against it. Okay. It doesn't work with exact. That's right. So a lot of contrib models won't work, it, work, work with it, but Drupal.org has very Mm -hmm. So we have proven it as a test case, and it's possible that sometime in the not too distant future, we might you know, have support for it. Okay, time. cool. I heard that there was also a problem with call user function array or something like that. That was also another part of the magic that uh, didn't give significant improvements. I think they said it performed the same as it would with APC or something like that yeah. on yeah, hip-hop. Uh -huh. Okay, cool. So for running PHP, you can use mod PHP. That's probably the most standard way people run it. It's, it's, uh, use, it's primarily used by Apache. There aren't many, no state is retained between the requests. Um, it's pretty well tested and supported, and the memory usage can be as low as 10 to 12 megs or it could easily be over 100 megs, depending on what you're installing on your site. So, you know, if you have something like, say, the CRM installed with your Drupal website and you have some stuff going on with views and CCK and you have another 100 modules installed with it. Um, sorry. <laughs> so, but that's one of the more standard ways of running it. And hopefully APC can help out with it. There's mod CGI, which was the old way of running PHP but honestly don't use it it's inefficient each request forks more processes it's it's not secure it's just not a good idea um, you can use fast cgi and that's used by uh, nginx and light tpd that's solely what they run with it is much much faster than cgi and you can also use it with apache and using it apache plus cgi has tested to be a lot more stable than mod PHP with lower memory usage. And we are actually running that on ladrupal.org and uh, drupalcampla.com as well. And yes? Yeah, so may I ask your why your pre preference to Apache over Nginx, for example, uh, which needs less memory and tends to handle the and stuff like that, right? Apache just has more features okay. than Nginx. So depending on what you want to use, if, if the site doesn't require those features, then <laughs> Nginx is probably the way to go with it. And I haven't used Nginx quite yet. I, I really want to. I want to make a test case for, for the IT team at my workplace as well. But everything I've heard about has, has been nothing short of good. So if you can use it and you don't require some of the features that Apache has, go for it. And from here we get into Drupal, which is which can be database intensive. It can be a CPU hog. It can use up a lot of memory, like over 100 megs. Some modules are completely known to be slow, and um, your site may not be affected in some cases by the bottleneck. And for some maintenance tips, disable any modules that you don't need. And for the modules that you do need, try to make a strong case on why you need them and if there's a way that you can not use them without, I mean, get the same set of features without using those set of modules. And you also want to make sure that cron runs regularly on the site. So it, it just keeps it all good. Some tools that you can use, uh, you could use Devel, which checks your page execution time, um, query execution time, it can tell you when duplicate queries are running, how much memory you've used. You can combine it with stress testing, and you can log pages which use the most queries. The only caveat is Devel is a somewhat heavy module. So, you know, just keep that in mind and use it on a test server, not on production. You can also use Trace, which uh, is useful for debugging. It can trace outputs, hook invocations, warnings. You can filter it by a lot of different query types. 
And you should watch out for, if you can avoid it, you should watch out for modules that call over the network. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, if they're calling web widgets or APIs like Dig, YouTube, or Flickr, if they are calling on those, hopefully they're at least caching whatever data they're able to retrieve from there. Otherwise, if they're doing it on each page request, and imagine doing something like that to Twitter or to uh, Flickr, especially if you have a large archive on there, it can take a huge amount of time to render that page. So uh, you can try to use helper modules to aid with reducing the bog. For some reason, I have weather on here, and I think I meant it as a module that you shouldn't use <laughs> because it does make those kind of calls each time without caching that data. So uh, it gets a big no-no from me. But job queue, queue mail, and SMTP mail module are, are pretty good about this stuff because it can queue up whatever mail you want to send out and things like that. So it's a, help. It's a very useful module. For page caching, it's, you know, it's primarily done for anonymous users. Doesn't necessarily affect authenticated users unless you're using the authenticated user cache module. It might expire too soon, so you want to set a minimum cache expiry time with it. And if you're using aggressive caching, it's not compatible with all modules, including the statistics module that's in core, but it can provide better performance for your site. And, but keep in mind that if you turn off page caching, you're not necessarily turning off all the other caching that's going on on your site. So filters, menus, blocks, variables, and forms, those are still going to get cached. And there is a module that will disable all caching on your site, but do not put it on production. Um, in terms of caching for anonymous users, aside from using something like Varnish, you can use a module called Boost. And what Boost will do is it will create HTML versions of the pages and store them in, in files. It does require some changes to your HT access files and some symlinks, but it is usable on shared hosts as well as on VPS and dedicated servers. And it, enable, it enhances the ability to handle large traffic spikes. Uh, a couple of years ago, Development Seed had a case study on using Boost for the anti-poverty event site, and they noted a performance gain by nearly a thousand times with it. So it was huge. They didn't need to install Varnish at that time, just this module, and that handled huge loads. You could also use something like Cache Router, which can allow, and I'll talk about this in more detail about using pluggable caching engines. You could use FS FastPath, which is another file caching mechanism, memcached, and the authenticated user cache that I'd mentioned uh, on the previous slide. So, pluggable caching is really easy to set up in Drupal. You just need to update the $conf variable in settings.php, and you can change it, you just, and you just point it to the path of where the caching file would be. So, it lets you have a custom caching module. And, like I mentioned, you can use it to completely disable caching with that. But, in most cases, people will either use it with cache router or the memcache module. Now, memcached is a distributed object caching. Uh, it is distributed object caching in memory, and it was written by uh, Danga for LiveJournal. Everything lives in memory. It can span multiple servers. Um, it's it, like I said, it's very seamless for Drupal six. It can lower the number of queries you have on your site by half. It does have its own set of requirements, like um, Apache needs to be restarted. Um, more instances of uh, memcache servers equals more complexity, but in general it's pretty uh, pretty safe. You could also, if you're using cache router, you could also use APC caching, so everything gets cached via APC. And the advantages to using APC over memcached would be that with memcached it actually has to make a call to the server. Even though it's on the same machine, it may be on the same machine, it has to make a network request to that server to be able to then retrieve that content from, RAM, from memory. Whereas with APC, it just directly accesses the RAM on that machine. So 
I've seen 10 to 20 times performance increase if you use APC for caching. But at the same time, if you have multiple web servers, it might not be the best way to go at it. One big thing you could do is you can change the search mechanism that you use. Um, core search is okay, I guess. But um, when we, on ZimmerTwins.ca, we had over a million nodes of content and some of the uh, search queries would take over 30 seconds. So, yeah, that says a lot about Drupal core search. I mean, a lot of people have said it. It's the best open source PHP search that's out there for C CMS. But, I mean, that's not really saying much, is it? So, you know, you can try another, you can try something else. For, for a while, I remember that now public was using the Sphinx engine, and Sphinx is a pluggable MySQL engine that you can use. And they saw a significant um, performance uh, increase with using that. The other way, and more standard ways nowadays, are to use Apache Solar, which is really fast. It can be a pain to configure, because it does require a server on which Java can be installed but it is available as a Drupal module. And alternatively, you know, companies like Acquia offer services to use their setup, which completely takes the load off your own server. You could also use the Lucene API. And Lucene, the Lucene API that was created is basically a uh, PHP port of, of Lucene, which was written in Java. And Apache Solar is quite similar to that. This module is not as fast as Apache Solar, but it is very easy to install. You, you just download it, install it on your site, and you're ready to go. And you could work with that before you move on into something more full-fledged like Solar. The other option, and in all honesty, this might be the best option for a lot of users, just use the Google Custom Search Engine. It, it's probably going to provide you better search results than Core Drupal would. Not on a private site. I mean, again, like there are use cases where, you know, Google CSC doesn't work. But for public sites, I mean, for a long time, people recommended searching for for issues on Drupal.org using Google. So, yeah. And other things you can do are you could use an optimized distribution of Drupal, Pressflow, and What's, bay, what's come out of Pressflow, Mercury, is one such thing. It's, uh, it was created by Four Kitchens and a lot of the other members that actually maintain Drupal.org. It, it supports database replication. It only supports MySQL, but at the same time, most people only use MySQL. It cleanly supports reverse proxies such as Varnish, i.e. it can remove cookies and all of that. It has a module to remove cookies from being served to anonymous users. And it is optimized for PHP 5. And Mercury is a build that's based on Pressflow. And in most cases, when people use it as an Amazon machine image, it's, uh, it installs uh, an installation of Solar, Varnish, and Memcached with it. And it does have tuned Apache settings as well. Uh, I've used it, and the performance is, is very good. Um, it's, it's definitely an avenue for people to think about. The other options, and these are really last resorts, uh, patching Drupal, which, yeah, the other name for it, for it would be HackCore. And for obvious reasons, it's not recommended unless you really know what you're doing. And even if you really know what you're doing, it's not recommended. But sometimes it is necessary. And in those instances, you want to hack core from a safe distance. So if you're trying to hack a core module, copy it into your site's, you know, whatever your site name is and modules directory, and then apply the changes. And then you could use, uh, you know, your own pluggable. You, other things you could do are you could use plug pluggable caching to have your own version of caching or uh, create schema changes in a separate module. So then you can remove them cleanly in the future or create your own module Override the original mechanism if the call is if the process is called through the form builder. 
So you can change the submission or validation to point to yours. And have an easy way to track changes you have made. So use, uh, you know, use a code repository and use trackers with it. So then you can you have an idea of what you have done in case something goes wrong with, with your modifications. And these are two examples where I did have to patch core. One is uh, the site that I was developing for ZimmerTwins.ca. It was painfully slow. There, that site had about 600,000 users. And whenever users were trying to log in, it took more than five seconds per user. And the core, uh, the core part of the problem was that the database was not using an index on the username because it has select from the user where name is like lower whatever it might be. And you, you'll notice this on Drupal.org right now as well, where it explicitly only takes the, it's case sensitive when you want to put in the username now. In the past it wasn't. And the original issue is, is here. Uh, issue number 83738. I think it's marked as a duplicate now, and it's been solved for Drupal 7. Though I don't remember if it's been draw, solved for Drupal 6. The bug's been around since 2006, and a solution is uh, modified. The, the issue does have a modified patch, though it was never really applied. And when I used that solution, the login time went down to less than 0.1 seconds. So, yeah. And as I mentioned, login has required matching case for the past few months on Drupal.org. The second case was... Um, I had to create a module where I had to do checks on the comments table based on the user ID. And the comments table does not have an index on the user ID. So anytime I tried to do a query against it, it took a long time. So the solution was to create an index on user ID as an update. And I didn't want to really tackle the tack this into the comments uh, module and put it in as an update in there. So my solution was to add it to the module that actually required this change, add it as an update, and then if I ever change the schema down the line, then I can remove this update if need be. So it's much cleaner this way. And yeah, loading for comments by users was no longer an issue. So, so things module developers can do. Take advantage of caching, be it using you know, Drupal's cache set and and all that stuff, or doing it statically in your code. So, and use your memory wisely. So, unset the variable if you don't have a need for it down the line. Or save the memory variable to memory for future use so processing is not done multiple times. If you can, take advantage of the uh, aha functionality that's there in the forms. There are fewer queries, you're not reloading the page again, and you're saving on bandwidth. So there are savings there. And going with the AHA functionality, you sh it's a good idea to learn to use jQuery. And it just falls in line with the above. And other related camp presentations that are going on this year, um, there's Flash Storage as a Game Changer by Christoph Weber, and that's tomorrow. Actually, all three of these are tomorrow, I believe. There's also installed Drupal 7 with Ubuntu 9.10 on Amazon EC2. Now, it is Drupal 7, but it is also on EC2. And it might, if people are interested in seeing how you manage an e, a instance in the cloud, this might be something that could be worthwhile. And John Fiala is talking about building on Solar Search. Now, I'm not sure if he's talking about actual performance but it again, it might be worthwhile to see how you could hook your own content into solar and so then you could use it in the future for your site and and that's it yes yes very it I was really impressed by it uh, i let me remember, I believe the client got a reserved instance of it, and it had about 4 gigs of memory on there. And yeah, it was performing really, it has been performing really well so far. Like, 
look on Drupal.org, Josh has posted some performance stats he did. He got crazy results on an hour stage. And, and again, this is partly because they are using Varnish, and Varnish really speeds up your site. It's even if you weren't using uh, Mercury in the cloud, you, installing Varnish by yourself might be something really worthwhile to do, especially if you're serving anonymous content. It's not only on EC2, and they have like a Linux stack script. Yes. Yes, so that could be something to look at as well. I I had used one of those on a site that I installed because they didn't want the uh, site on EC2. And it's pretty easy to follow. Yes? You were talking about using um, Aquia service with solar, with API on the solar service on there. Uh, mm -hmm. on there. So I, how does that not use your server? Don't they have to hit the database to search there? Or they... Well, what will happen is when cron tasks run for indexing your site, all of that indexing material is sent to their servers. So then whenever search is run, it's querying against that. So depending on what kind of use you have your content, you may want to run cron more often. Yes. But again, the, the actual act of doing search is completely offloaded from your site. And if a lot of users are using search on, on your site, then then it's, uh, it, you could see a huge increase. And the other thing to consider is that Views 3 is going to have, uh, I think you can plug different kinds of backends that it can query against, and Solar is one of them. So imagine having your views powered by Solar. It's, it's big. Flipping into the Solar discussion, I think it's a wrap that the Solar does that is hard to install. I don't quite agree with that when I installed it. And I have to say, I'm a to experience admin, but you, know, you follow the recipe, it goes on relatively cleanly. The default configurations as per D.0 mm -hmm. are quite sane. And it really was a non-issue as far I, as I'm concerned. It's just another thing you throw on your server. Right. So I, I don't quite get it why people say it's okay. I should clarify my issue on that one. It's hard to install on FreeBSD <laughs> for, uh, for known reasons. Um, with that said, I did try to install it on OS X, and it was a snap. And yes, I do agree. But FreeBSD is not fun. In the back, sorry. In non server technical, if you have to update your Java version, it's a pain in the butt. If you have to update your Java version, it's not that bad. It's pretty quick and easy. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> huh. Are there any other questions? I guess that's a wrap. Oh. <laughs> I was curious whether there's anything written up on Google.org or similar sites on MySQL tuning schools that you could provide. as opposed to the more generic links that you provided. Hmm. I'm sure there are some settings that work for many people at once, as opposed to, yeah, try this or try that, but you might want to, you know, fiddle. I'm not entirely sure. That's a good question. In, in the past, I've generally found, when I follow some of the advice, especially the advice on MySQL performance, uh, blog.com, it's, it's provided significant... Um, uh, it has provided significantly good results 
on my site, uh, on, on my set of sites. Um, the gentleman in the back. Uh, one other thing that might be worth noting in the database section, uh, in addition to MariaDB, uh, another hot client is the database technology. Databases. Yes. Is it available for s Drupal 7? Yes. Um, so uh, we've tested and plugged it a little bit. It's not uh, perfectly ready for prime time yet, but uh, it's pretty interesting. It's kind of neat technology to move forward. So it's probably worth mentioning. It's something that's definitely yes. getting a lot of traction. Especially, yes, ongoing with Drupal 7 and with the uh, new database drivers that were written, or the object oriented manner in which the database drivers were written, it does make it easier to have more pluggable or different uh, engines that power your site and MongoDB is heavily uh, touted by Chex. And I think he's the person that's writing a good chunk of that module as well, correct? Along with a few others? Yes, Damien. But there are a lot of people Okay. So that's something to definitely look for forward to in uh, in Drupal seven. Cool. Well, thank you very much, everyone.